Welcome to Why Rocks, a BYU Department of Geological Sciences podcast. We are fortunate to be here today with Dr. Cheney Radabaugh. Uh, Dr. Radabaugh, uh, tell us, how long have you been in the Department of Geology? Well, I keep saying 15 years. Oh, so. oh it's longer than that, because <laughs> you, you joined when you were like 12 years old. Okay. So a couple of things about Dr. Radabaugh. Dr. Radabaugh loves to travel. In fact, we should pause there for a second. What is what is your favorite country to travel to? Wow, that's difficult. How many countries have you been to? Yeah, I keep forgetting to add this up. I do tend to go back to the same places. I might just reach to somewhere crazy and say Ethiopia. It's beautiful. Wow. And very strange and different. Do you have to? Okay, favorite country. But what about a favorite place? If you could, if we, if we didn't have to do this podcast, and you could just go to some park or some city or some cafe, where would that be? Uh, it would probably have to be the side of Kilauea volcano if it's erupting. Very nice, very nice. A uh, number of years ago, just for our listeners, Doctor Radaba had to get her passport renewed, and she was so upset because all of the stamps in her old passport. Dozens and dozens and dozens of stamps. And now she was going to look like a rookie, like she'd never done this before. And she... <laughs> there gets a bads about that. The people just flipping through it and looking at me really annoyed. <laughs> Where am I going to find a page stamp. I could yeah. stamp? That is really funny. Uh, tell us something else. What is one more thing that is just super interesting about Dr. Radaba? Oh, man. There are so many to choose, bro. <laughs> That's true. My I, Okay, so I guess I should say... My favorite place probably is the beach and the water, even though I haven't spent a ton of time there compared to everywhere else. I mean, I'm from Utah and grew up here, but every time I've been by that seashore, I just want to just swim, just keep going yeah. and going and going. Dr. Radaboff, how many how many of the continents have you been to? I've been to all seven continents uh, twice. Some of them. In one year. All seven continents in one year, twice. Yeah. She's the only person that I know who's been to all seven continents, and I believe that... You've been to Antarctica four times? Four times. Tell us about that. Tell us about what you're doing there and how that works. When I went to school at the University of Arizona in Tucson, I had a number of colleagues who were involved in this program to go down and look for meteorites in Antarctica, Antarctic search for meteorites. And I was like, why would you go there? It's so cold and just, you know, it's just snow and ice as far as you can see. And you live in a tent. The six call of the world. You know. And I thought, well, it would be a big adventure. And so I asked my friend with this palm tree waving outside, why would I want to go somewhere so cold? And she's like, go, go, go. And so she helped me get introduced to the right people. And that's really important in any field is meet the right people, tell them why you can help their their program. And I got to go. And I realized that this is just the perfect place to study space on Earth or to experience what it's like to be a space researcher. If you find a rock sitting on top of five kilometers of ice, it likely fell from space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just white everywhere and then just a rock from space. And it's just like a little treasure, a precious, precious jewel sitting there waiting for you to collect it. And that's a spectacular okay. experience. Biggest meteorite you have found in Antarctica. All right. So about a month ago in the news, there was a big article. Oh, we found a 17-pound meteorite. You know, oh, we're, and I was like, wait, didn't we? And I wrote my friend Jim, who's up at the University of Utah in charge of ANSMET. Didn't we find... We found a head-sized one. I remember it was a head size, and he's all, yeah, 45 pounds. <laughs> oh, I guess we forgot to tell everybody. Oh, yeah. Uh, sized to meet here. I had a hard time picking it up and putting it in the back of the snowmobile. Well, 45 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Now, was that asteroid sourced? Yeah, almost all of them. 95% of what we find in Antarctica is from the asteroid belt. Okay. 4.5 billion years old, so just... The basic building blocks materials of the solar system. But you have found meteorites in Antarctica sourced from other places. From the moon? One of the first times I was down, uh, we found this beautiful black shiny rock, and it turned out to be from the moon. That is so cool. I know. So something had to smash into the moon, launch it off the surface, and then eventually... Yeah. And now there's a piece of it in Brooke's office. <laughs> exactly. You can buy it. That's right. They cut it up into thin pieces, and our <laughs> department chair has a slab of moon rock in his office that, w that was a meteorite. It was a meteorite that landed in the Sahara, most yeah, of them. Because they're owning an actual moon rock that was brought back by Apollo would be somewhat illegal. Illegal. Yes. Yeah, those are federal property. <laughs> yeah. 
What about Mars? If you have a Martian meteorite? Do we have a bunch, uh, not a bunch, uh, slightly less because Mars is farther away, but we have some from Mars. We have some from the asteroid Vesta, something smashed into the south pole of that and launched. I, I've heard it's a room full of materials worth. Wow. That uh, sits on the Earth from Vesta. Um, and then and the, the stuff that I love is, oh, I picked up a, a rock one day, we we all together, and there were big chunks, big crystals of feldspars and olivines, and the geologists will know about this and love, and love that. Oh, wow. And say, oh, that had to be from the moon, right? And I thought for sure. Turns out it's not from the moon. It's not from Mars. It's not from Vesta. We can tell because of the chemical fingerprint. It's I was just going to ask you to explain that. Yeah. Yeah, so all the little uh, chemistry and the isotopes and everything just work out so that we, we know exactly where it comes from, especially because we have samples from. But that one, you don't know where it's from. No, it was a body that must have broken up, must have existed, was big enough to have lava flows on the surface, and then broke up. So it just doesn't exist anymore, and it's, it's sad to think about. There were a lot of bodies like that. And that is cool. And that is cool. Meteorites in Utah. We have found a couple. In fact, when I say we, I mean the geology department has found two in a dry lake bed, um, kind of near Delta. And it turns out those are good places to collect meteorites. The things wash in from all over, they get blown around on the surface. And so we found two just little tiny ones. Um, and, and then last year, there was uh, an event, the Utah Meteor. I'm just gonna ask you about that. And you may remember this, you know, this thing lit up the sky. You could see it for, for you know, like two hours worth of a drive uh, in any direction. So it was, a, it was a really big. Just up over to the west of Salt Lake. Exactly. Um, we There's a new method to use Doppler radar, same as with weather, to watch the motion of, of the atmosphere. And when something really big like that comes in, it actually pushes the atmosphere and causes there to be a big Doppler radar return. So we could see that it streaked right over the Great Salt Lake and the salt flats. Fortunately for the meteorite, the Great Salt Lake was very low. Yeah, exactly, exactly. In fact, I think there were probably pieces that fell right into the lake that we'll never recover. Right? So this buddy of mine, Jim, called me up. He's like, hey, do you want to go hunt for a meteorite? And oh, we're used to going out and finding meteorites on white surfaces. And I don't imagine it. They didn't have to ask twice. Oh, yeah. I said, let's go. What can I drive? And, uh, and we got out there. And while we were walking across the salt flat, we got a text from his buddy in Scotland at a meteorite meeting who said, oh, this guy just found a fist-sized piece wow. about four miles away from you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my, but I love my water, and it doesn't matter. So we just kept going. Fist-sized piece. Fist-sized piece. And we're walking, we're, we're going to find something. And we crossed right over that Doppler path, and we never found anything. Uh, but off in the distance, we could see him. So we, we ran into him. He was very nice. He showed us his beautiful piece. This fresh meteorite that had just fallen, that's the difference between the ones I find in Antarctica. They, they've been there maybe, um, you know, a million years. Yeah. And this one fell yesterday. I mean, it was just just amazing to see that. And he gave a chunk to the University of Utah, which was nice of him. Now, is that really the only piece that's been found? Well, so the other issue is we're really lucky we ran into this collector because collectors go out and they pick it up and they keep it. And they don't tell them. And then it shows up on eBay. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm guessing there were more found, but none were reported that I know of. And Janie Radabaugh, meteorite hunter extraordinaire. I just, I wish I had a cool four-wheeler like Sunny. The collector did because we were on foot and we were like, oh, okay. And out of water, miles from the car, exactly. middle of summer, dry lake bed. It's not not wise. Right? Yeah. And he didn't give you a ride. Oh, yeah. This giant four wheeler. And he said, I, I wish I could give you a ride, but I can't fit you. I was like, I'll stand on one side. <laughs> 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 when did you develop this attraction to space? I was lucky to grow up in the 70s when we had Star Wars and then followed by Indiana Jones, followed by... I am your father. Yeah. So, I mean, really, probably Steven Spielberg is the reason that I that I went into, into space research. Close Encounters, all of those movies just were so compelling. So you wanted to ride on the Millennium Falcon and yeah. you went I into space. To Luke Skywalker. Okay. Like, exploring the have a and everything, so... Um, so, yeah, anyway, I could do that. And I think I also saw a film by, uh, at the Air and Space Museum in D.C., and it was a giant Earth, and I just thought, oh, I love this image of Earth. I still have that emblazoned in my, in my mind. So the idea of understanding planets and studying them, and being a planetologist or planetary scientist, which I found out about much later, it took me all the way through undergrad to find that there was a field that everybody studies that's in this that um, fit me really well. So when you were doing your bachelor's degree here at BYU in physics, which we have forgiven you for, you weren't necessarily dialed in on planetary science. No, I mean, I think at that time I still thought about, oh, if you want to study space, it's astronomy. Gotcha. Gotcha. I learned a lot about astronomy. I loved my time in that field and in that major. Uh, but then I thought, I really want something more tangible and close up. 
I went to a meeting called the Lunar Planetary Science Conference in Houston, um, and that started out on Johnson Space Center as a way to understand the rocks they were bringing back from the moon and how to plan, and it's grown since then to include all the bodies in the solar system. And I was like, wow, they're talking about rocks on Mars. Like, you can do geology on Mars? And so then I thought, oh, maybe I'll look into geology. And uh, that, I, and I got hooked immediately the minute I started looking at geology. So you finished your master's degree in geology here at BYU. Yes. And then off to Arizona. Yeah, then the University of Arizona has a whole program called Planetary Science. I was like, why didn't I know about this before? It's perfect. And, uh, and yeah, so they're, they're sending missions out. The latest thing they're doing from the University of Arizona is the OSIRIS-REx mission, big long acronym. Uh, that is to bring a sample back from an asteroid. And it comes to the Utah desert September. Because it's already been picked up. Yeah, they planted, they grabbed it, and now they're on the way back. Let's fast forward a little bit into your your very, very amazing career. Dr. Radabot has been on the BYU homepage, you know, the face of the BYU homepage, more times in her career at BYU than all of the other faculty in the geology department combined. People love space. So, yes. I mean, you just present the information and then people will love it. How many astronauts have taken you to dinner? <laughs> oh, well, either that or I've taken them to dinner. <laughs> How many astronauts have you had dinner with? There's yeah. a question. Yeah, I would say a good, I'm, I'm very lucky in that sense, probably 20 um, or, or even more than that. And and it's a range of astronauts, shuttle astronauts, um, modern day sort of uh, go up to the space station astronauts, and then Apollo astronauts. Yeah, I was just going to bring up. Real with that, yeah. Who do you know personally who has walked on the moon? I know Charlie Duke, who's walked on the moon in Apollo 16. I know um, Jack Schmidt, who, who was a geologist and walked on the moon in Apollo 17. And uh, Dave Scott, who was the commander for Apollo 15. A handful of others. Jim Lovell, who flew around the moon in Apollo 13. In fact, Jim Lovell came to campus. Yes, yeah. And right. while he was here, he requested that you be one of his hosts on campus. Yeah, there's this really neat event called Space Fest, and I've been lucky to be involved in that as a science speaker. And then there are astronauts that go and, and sign things, and it's a, a great community and a, a great way to have met these extraordinary people. Now, currently, you're working with NASA. How long have you been working with NASA? Always, I think even as a graduate student, you know, NASA helps give us the money that we're using to do our research. And so in that sense, we, we work with them, but also I'll, I'll review things for them and be on committees for them. So. so you work with NASA now, like you go to Houston and go to meetings. Well, sometimes we, it still is this, you know, NASA's all headquartered at DC and they have these branches out there and they'll work with us. And, but yeah, right now there is a mission and it's run from NASA, and it's called Dragonfly. So, so don't go too much further. <laughs> yeah. You were sitting in your office uh, a year or two ago, and there were three projects that were up for this funding from NASA, but only one of them was going to win. Tell us about that. We were down to two, two projects going to win. Tell us about that day. So, I mean, I, first of all, I couldn't believe that this could actually go all the way through because you usually have to run a mission through a couple of times. It takes a lot of work to put it together, to do all the technical details to prove that it's going to work and that it's exciting to everybody. So we're running this up for the first time, but it was an exciting idea. It's a, a drone quadcopter that would fly around on a, a planetary body. And so I thought, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe, but I doubt it, you know. And so then all of a sudden this email came in and I just, just screamed, just to scream. <laughs> yes, she did. I thought something bad had happened in her office. <laughs> yeah. And uh, right, I was like, what happened? Who died? You know, and no, our mission, our mission, our mission. So, and then it's really exciting. So when is the launch date? 2027, which is actually going to come a lot sooner than we think. It's 2023 right now. Yeah, we're exiting uh, the major review by NASA. That's, that's a sticking point. That's like, hey, if you don't pass this review, which actually happened last week, then you're not moving forward. So everything is in, in good shape and, and it's going to do great. But, you know, we're still waiting for that final. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and build, go ahead and cut metal, is what they say. So we haven't started to build the machine yet. There are engineering models and all kinds of things in place, but the actual Dragonfly is not being built yet. Now, what is your part, your expertise, supplies to the mission, how? I'm a science team member, and they chose me because I study sand dunes on Titan, which is a moon of Saturn. That's exactly where this thing is going to go. It's going to fly around and land in some sand dunes. 
scoop up sand, which we think is made of organic materials. That sounds, that sounds weird. So it's not like sand on Earth. Yeah, exactly. It's, what is it, like plastic or grape nuts? I keep trying to find an analog. It was made up in the atmosphere. It snowed down. It got eroded into pieces that the wind blows around. And there are just thousands, thousands of sand dunes. And maybe those little organic pieces could be seeds for life. And so we're just curious what happened on Titan and is there life there? Now, there's also other things. So Titan has sediment or in the sand grains. What else does Titan have that's kind of similar to where we live? Well, it has an atmosphere of nitrogen, just like Earth. The pressure is the same at Earth's surface. So really, you could send astronauts there, and it would do. they do pretty well because they do. So they would need a pressurized suit, yeah. just the oxygen. Just a warm winter coat. There. Yeah. And a scuba mask. And a scuba mask. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, it's Earth-like in a lot of ways. Rivers, mountains, lakes. Rivers. Rivers. Tell us about the rivers. And these are fish rivers. Yeah, maybe fish. That's what we hope. Uh, the rivers are full of methane. So, Methane's a gas. Yeah, exactly. But at Titan, it's so cool that it's a liquid, and it rains methane onto the surface, flows through rivers. We see that the rivers are full. We see that the lakes are full. This is the only other body in the solar system. It's having a drought like we are. Water. Yeah, exactly. Not water, liquid. And yeah. there's no smoking on Titan. No smoking on Titan. Luckily, there's no oxygen in the atmosphere, so you'd be kind of safe. Okay. okay. Well, okay. So you're going to launch in four years. Yeah. And so then a couple of weeks later, you'll be on Titan. Mm -hmm. Well, we thankfully got a heavy lift rocket. Um, we don't know which one yet. There's three or so we can choose from. So that shaved a good few years off. Really? But years. Still, still, it's going to take us till 2034 to arrive. So 34. These places are far away. Saturn is 10 times as far away from the sun as the Earth. That's 11 years from now. Yeah. That's, that's the year I will retire. <laughs> yeah, so... One thing we thought about is um, I went to visit these large, these mega sand dunes in Namibia. This is with a lot of the mission leadership from Dragonfly. And we did that, it turns out, almost 10 years ago. And we thought, oh, it would be neat to plan a field trip with everybody on this mission team and, and go to the sand dunes in Namibia. They're exact analogs for what we'd see in Titan. They're really gigantic. They have these big spaces between the dunes. We could fly a bunch of drones around. And if we did that this fall, that'd be a 10-year mark. And then 10 more years from now, we will be there. So it's like we can bracket we can bracket um, Dragonfly's arrival with these dune trips. So most of your travel here on Earth is related to finding things that will allow you to better understand what you're going to see. Yeah, exactly. So Earth is, is a really interesting planet. I'm glad I live on Earth. I'm glad we all live here. Because, because we die if we lived on a different one. Exactly. Um, but it's got everything. It's got, you know, uh, an active erosion cycle. It's got an atmosphere. It's got an, an active interior, plate tectonics, volcanoes. And so you really can find an analog to just about everything you see out there in the solar system. And it's much easier to go and put yourself in that place on Earth than it is to try to go to, you know, moon of Jupiter and sit next to a volcano there. And so um, so we, we study things here and then apply that to other planets. So is that why you went to Iran? <laughs> okay. Uh, and so, didn't tell anybody you were going. I may or may not have gone to Iran. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the next part of this podcast may be hypothetical. Yeah. Uh, in 2016, I said to my friend, hey, you know that we have these perfect, beautiful wind carved ridges that we're studying in uh, that are on Mars, that cover the surface of Mars, they're on Titan, they're on Venus. And we find them in Argentina, for example. They're kind of scattered. There's a few in the Mojave, but they're little. Would those be yardangs? They're called yardangs, yeah, exactly. And they're named for the, this is Turkmenish word. People found them wandering around in, in Afghanistan and in Turkey and China. And so, okay, we've gone to some in China, but the perfect, beautiful, longest ones are in Iran. And Of course. <laughs> and so I told, I've been saying to all these friends, hey, we need to go to Iran. They're like, you can't go to Iran. What are you talking about? And uh, finally, I not tell Janie Radabaugh what she can and cannot do. So I convinced my friend Laura Kerber, hey, we should go to Iran before the election in 2016 because things were pretty good back prior to that. Uh, and, and we can go. Oh. And so she wrote me two weeks later. I, I wrote you 10 emails that said, we can't go, we can't go. And I realized we can. We go through the Pakistan embassy. We get a tour guide. This is my number one rule for travel, tour guides, local tour guides, because they know exactly where you can go and where and how to keep you safe. And. So we found ourselves in the desert of Iran, wandering among the Ardangs of Iran. And I'm so proud of that trip. I just can't believe, I can't believe we made it. And they are spectacular. And we want to go back. What was it that you told your dad that you were going to be doing? Laura lives in, in 
Southern California. So I said, Dad, I'm going to fly to LA and pick up Laura, and we're going to go to the desert for a couple of weeks, and I will call you when I'm back. You just didn't specify which desert. Exactly. Yeah, she did the same with her parents. We also brought a friend, Justin. He did tell his parents. Um, Justin is a very successful bass player in New York City and speaks Farsi. So we brought him. And he had told his parents that every night, how are you doing? Where are you? What are you doing? And he's like, oh, I shouldn't have told them. <laughs> yeah. So not only is Dr. Radabaugh the only person I know who's been to Antarctica four times, all seven continents in the same year, she's also the only person I know who's been to Iran. And what, so was that information that you were able to gather, was that useful? Very useful. We realized that even though these, these features in Iran are beautiful and spectacular and large and young, they're not perfect analogs for Mars. The ones that are perfect are in Argentina in the high plateau. So we go back there regularly. It's it's very high. It's like 12,000 feet and you suffer because you're walking around up there all day and it's it's dry, but it's a beautiful you know, landscape, white ridges with these dark gravels and blue sky overhead. And what desert is that? It's called the Puna. It's south of the Atacama Desert High Plateau behind the Andes. Today, you are kind of a world expert on Titan and the dunes and things that Project Dragonfly will see. This house hasn't always been the case. Tell us about graduate school in Arizona. Yeah, so Arizona was the perfect place to be for graduate school for me. I First of all, my expertise was on Io, Jerry's Air Week's Moon, and uh, that was my thesis. So my thesis wasn't even remotely related to Titan. I jumped onto that after because Cassini was arriving at Saturn, and I could help them look at things, and then we stumbled into the dunes. But before that, I just thought, oh, I love volcanoes, everything about them. I could organize a database of all the volcanoes on Io. I could study these. I could figure out their temperatures and their, how they erupt. And that was just fascinating for me. And I, I loved every minute of that. And early on, I mean, before you were probably even in graduate school, we didn't even know that there were volcanoes on Io. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So prior to 1979, which is when uh, the Voyager spacecraft flew by, uh, everyone just looked at these objects and thought, well, there's four moons orbiting Jupiter. Who knows what's going on? But some some scientists looked and said, well, wait, they're orbiting in, in a, a dance, a resonance, so that it, it keeps the orbits so that they're a little bit farther from Jupiter and a little closer, and it causes this tidal squeezing and massaging. We should see volcanoes on Io. This is a lot of friction, a lot of heating. And so that prediction was made, and then like a month later, the spacecraft flew by and saw a giant volcanic plume erupting off of this tiny like at the exact plume. same moment yeah yeah which and it turns out you would actually be kind of it'd be hard for you not to see a plume erupting there because there are so many eruptions all the time more so than even the earth more so than the earth the earth um is bigger and so there's maybe more area covered by volcanoes but there are hundreds of active and dozens erupting right now um, on io that you can see from space very cool Exciting. Yeah. And Io, we think, is, you know, so it's so active that it might have been like an early Earth. And it could represent, yeah, what would the landscape look like on an early Earth just as life was getting started on Earth? What kind of obstacles were there? Um, and, and, and we don't have any evidence of that because it's all been erased through erosion. So we think Io is a good example of early Earth and maybe other exoplanets that are heated by their moons as well, or by their planets. You do realize that you have a fan club, right? I don't know if it, it's not my students, probably. I know that you have a Wikipedia page. That's true. I do have a Wikipedia page. I mean, I don't have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> they won't let me add my own pictures to my Wikipedia. <laughs> you can't add your own Wikipedia. Can you add your own content? Because I guess part of it is a picture of me, so somebody else had to take it unless it looks healthy. Anyway. That's funny. Yeah. So people really like what you do. How would somebody follow in the footsteps of Dr. Janie Radabaugh? Uh, I have been super lucky in my life to be able to have all these opportunities to go out and travel. I do look for those things now, and I guess I would say if, you, if you're if you interested in, in travel and exploring, um, just look for those things and try to take advantage of opportunities when they come up, whatever they are, because you'll get experience and you'll be able to return and, and expand upon your, your knowledge as you go. Um, study abroad is a great way to do it. I honestly think part of the reason I'm, I, I pursued travel later is I did study abroad to London when I was a sophomore at BYU. Uh, and it was a really impactful time for me, and I, I loved every minute. Your travel has then become a lot more geological. That's true. Yeah, so I realized, okay, I know how to travel. I know how to do this, and I can apply those skills 
to this field. Um, I, I could go to that place. I could put my feet there and stand on that ground and then and learn about it and apply that to other bodies. So I, I guess, too, find something that you love about um, you know science or, or whatever it is you're doing and uh, become very good at that. Uh, find your niche and, and become the expert, and then people will need you to do that work. So having a passion for the subject, important. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Find what you love. That was an, a piece of advice given to me by an astronaut. I think it might have been Ron Lind. Or Charm Such a name drop. <laughs> I think it was actually Charlie Walker because I said, I want to be an astronaut, uh, which I really did. And he said, that is great. And I hope you are, you know, hope you can achieve that goal. But just know that, you know, I mean, a lot of people want to play in the NBA and they don't get to do that. So, <laughs> so um, find something that you love and that you're good at that can relate to this field and you can still do no matter what. And so I really did think carefully about that and took that to heart. You, you phrased that sentence about the wanting to be an astronaut. You phrased it in the past tense. <laughs> okay, I did want it early. I still do want it. I would love to go into space. I've applied a number of times. I think my portfolio is pretty good for them right now. So if I'm not getting the call, well, it's not. I'm not exactly what they want, which I think still at this point, they would still like engineers, uh, doctors, and things for um, orbiting in the space station. Space station. But they're about to go to the moon. Um, I, I think I already know who the first person to walk on the moon will be. I think it's Jessica Watkins, and she's perfect for that. She's an um, American planetary scientist, uh, African-American woman, and she she's ready, and she's already been up in space. So that first those first waves are going to be people who are, are going to do a lot of that heavy, hard work, that am, ambassadorial work, and, and I just want to sneak in there and then just explore around on the moon afterwards. And so, so that's all good. I'll wait. I'll bide my time. William Shatner wouldn't take you up with him when he went on the, I mean. I'll go. Yeah. I'll look into those pri private uh, options as well because yeah, I, have I know no, they're just growing. I have no doubt that one day you will orbit the planet. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Why spend all of this time studying space when there's so many issues that we're having here on Earth? What's the, what's the reasoning behind it? That's a really great question. I mean, I used to think, oh, there's plenty of money. We could do both missions. We could do all these things. And I've since learned in working with NASA, no, we have a limited budget and we can only do so much. And so we have to choose which things to do. And in that extends to what we do as a country and what we do as a world. What do we want to spend our, our time and our resources on? Uh, and I, I believe there are a couple of, of good answers here. The first is, well, when we work together at something that's really difficult to do, like going to the moon or going out to outer space, we develop skills that come back to pay off for us. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Uh, yeah. And that's even technologically. That's that's a really stupid way, way to think of it. So, um, so as we think about, well, we ha we got wi wireless internet because of the space station. We got you know prosthetic limbs. We got just all kinds of things that, that came about because we were all working together for this single cause. So if we don't do this, there should be something else uh, technology-wise that we're putting a lot of effort into. But then if we don't do this, why would we be excited to do anything else? We are excited by space, and and it's inspiring to everybody, no matter what your, your uh, pursuits are. Like you could be an artist, you can be a, a business person, you could be in law, you could be in STEM, and all of those things are are inspiring to you to look up and realize, hey, we're, we're exploring out there in, in space. We're explorers. We're naturally born explorers. And I, I realized this the other night. I was walking home and I looked up and saw um, Venus and Jupiter up in the night sky just coming down at sunset and straight overhead is the moon. And I couldn't help it. I want to, up to every student I could see is like, hey, there's there's Venus and Jupiter right there. And they're like, they just paused. Every, every person paused. Wow, thank you for showing me. And a whole group, oh my gosh. And they could talk about it. And I know none of them were majors, but they were they were excited by this. And uh, I don't want us to lose that enthusiasm. I think the more exploring of space we do, the more appreciative we'll be of our solar system, our universe, this place where we all live. And something that you develop for this mission to Titan, who knows how that might benefit mankind might, you know, 20 years from now. Exactly, yeah. Drone technology, you know, that we have to do really well to work in space maybe can come and help us on Earth. Yeah. We would like to thank Dr. Janie Radaboff for joining us today, and we would like to thank you for listening in. This has been Why Rocks, a BYU Department of Geological Sciences podcast.